Hi, my name is Billy Noel. Welcome to Desert Island Tim's. It's my pleasure today to invite Stephen O'Donnell to the island. Stephen is an author whose writing focuses around Scottish football. It's good to have you here, Stephen. How are you? Good, Billy. Thanks. Good to be here. So what was life like growing up? It was good. Uh, I was afflicted with asthma and eczema uh, intermittently, but uh, apart from that, I was very fortunate, really. Uh, my, my dad's from Kirkintilloch and my mum's from Lennox Town. Uh, and because my dad worked for the government, we moved away from Scotland when I was still quite young and we did a lot of moving about, so for that reason I was sent to boarding school um, and I, up in the Highlands. I went to Fort Augustus, the Abbey School, which uh, you might have heard featuring in, in the news quite a lot recently, with some pretty serious and d- disturbing allegations of sexual abuse, which centred on one individual in particular. I mean, he was long gone by the time I was there, and. I never came across anything of that nature at all during my time at the school, but there was one old boy, uh, Father Gregory, who was accused in the programme of physical abuse back in the day. He was obviously a bit overzealous when it came to dishing out corporal punishment uh, back in the 50s and 60s. I mean, he was an old old guy by the time I knew him. And he was my piano teacher, and I was hopeless at the piano at, at the time. I never used to practice and I could see him getting more and more frustrated with me. Looking back now, he always managed to restrain himself, I don't know. Um, I was never in any bother with him, but it's interesting to look back and see that now, But because, you know, as I say, I never came across any of that in my whole time there. Um, and I actually fired off a cheeky tweet on Twitter to uh, Mark Daly, the investigative reporter, and I said to him, Mark, as I was really shocked to hear about the allegations at my former school, Fort Augustus, in your programme. But was there any squeamishness or embarrassment at all um, involved because of what was going on at the BBC at the time, at the same time, you know, with all these allegations against Jimmy Savile and all, all the rest of them? Um, and he tweeted back to me and he said, uh, no embarrassment at all, all abuse is unacceptable and must be investigated and exposed no matter what Um, and then I remember a couple of other people joined in the conversation and one of them somebody said uh, what about the wider public school system you know I I doubt that whether that would stand up to this kind of level of scrutiny so I was back on Twitter right away to Mark Daly and said come on Mark you know how about it what about uh, you know it's 100% true what you say about all abuse being wrong and unacceptable how about a wider investigation into you know what was going on at other public schools yeah. all across Scotland and England, but at that point, Mark Daly exited the conversation. You know we never heard from him again. But it was good. I enjoyed my time there. Uh, it wasn't easy because my parents were actually abroad for the first year or so, and I was ten years old and sent up to the Highlands. So I did a lot of growing up in that time. But and the problem was that my younger brothers couldn't join me because the school was, I could tell it was in financial difficulties at the time Um, and the year that I was in actually closed down when I moved up a year so my younger brothers coming through couldn't go to the same school so eventually I moved away yeah, no complaints, Uh, I got well educated I ended up quite well travelled from my childhood and I ended up back where I started, here in Scotland So your first song, what would that be? My first song is actually a tribute. Um, I remember when I was about 17 or 18, virtually everyone I knew wanted to play the guitar. Uh, my friends wanted to play the guitar. My younger brothers wanted to play the guitar. Uh, but I'd had piano lessons when I was younger, so I thought I'd, I'd be a keyboard player, just to be different. <laughs> um, and around about the same time, I became a bit obsessed with this band called The Doors and their lead singer, Jim Morrison in particular. And you probably know that the Doors have quite a distinctive organ sound. Um, and the keyboard player was a guy called Ray Manserek, who actually died this year. So I've been trying to bash out his tunes for virtually all my adult life, you know. So this is a tribute to him. I think he's one of the uh, most underrated 
keyboard players in rock, mm. and I think you've allowed me to pick the uh, the live version, yeah. so we can see some of his best work here. This is Light My Fire by The Doors. That was Light My Fire by The Doors. So what took you into writing? Yeah, well, I kind of landed in it by default, really. Um, I remember I was I was working in London in the in the nineties. I mean, I'd left uni, and like uh, it was quite a difficult time, I think, for the country and for the economy. Uh, there was a recession on, and very few people were taking people on and, and training them. So a lot of people were just kind of regurgitated out of the educational system, like you're in the world of work now. You know, get on with it. Mm -hmm. So I found myself working a, as a computer salesman in London. And I was sharing a flat with a guy, and he had a mate out in Prague, and he came to visit us and stayed with us. And he, and he, he said to us, why don't you come out on holiday and stay with me, just to reciprocate? So that's what we did, we went out to Prague, and at the end of the holiday, the guy said to me, you know, why don't you stay? Why don't you stay here, do what I've done, you know, I've quit my job, I, I live out here now, you know, have a great time, you can see what a great place is. And this is like at the airport, and I was like, well, I, c I can't just stay, you know, I've got, I'm on a plane home. I did think about it and I went back and I kind of made a list of reasons to quit my job and go and live in Prague or stay and just carry on doing what I was doing. And over the course of a few weeks, I think the reasons to stay just sounded like excuses more and more and the reasons to go seemed like good reasons. So that's what I did. I, I quit my job. I went out to live in Prague for a while. Uh, I'd been working in London, so you know I had a reasonably healthy bank balance and you know Prague was dead cheap at the time. But eventually, of course, you know, the money starts to run out. I did a bit of English teaching, but not nearly as much as I told my mum and dad. I was basically just, you know, enjoying myself. And then when the money ran out, I, I kind of, right, what do I do now? Do I stay in Prague and get a proper job? You know, but that, that would have kind of ruined it for me because I'd had such a good time there. So they, they, were, they they'd always said they'd keep my job back in London, but I had the chance uh, at the time to go back to Scotland. So that's what I did. I, I came back to Scotland, I was looking around for something to do and I kind of asked myself a question, what would I ideally really like to do? And by this stage, you know, I was in my late 20s, I'd kind of given up on the idea that I was ever going to play for Celtic. And I was quite realistic about that, so the next best thing on this was, you know, trying to get a book published. So that's what I did, I kind of started writing. The stuff that I was coming out with to start with was, was garbage, basically. And looking back on it now, I can't believe that I ever wrote that stuff. I kind of persisted with it, I developed my own style. And uh, a couple of years later, and it was years, um, I ended up with, you know, a shiny cuboid paperback with, you know, my name on the cover and words that I'd written on the inside. So that's how it all came about, really. The book's called Paradise Road. It's about a young guy from the west of Scotland who uh, was one of the most talented footballers of his generation in the country. But for reasons that become clear in the book, he fails to make the grade as a professional player and it's about what happens to him subsequently after he has to pick up his life again and that basically involves working as a joiner and following Celtic along with a crowd of his mates. But that's just a vantage point from which I have scoped to look closer at some of the issues involved so I have a look at sectarianism, the power and the role of the media in sport, declining standards in Scottish football and I'm able to ask pertinent questions like what is the role of young working class guys now that the manufacturing and heavy industries that used to sustain their communities have been more or less completely replaced mm -hmm. by the ever expanding retail and service sectors? You know, how have mm -hmm. people adapted to these changes? I try and paint a portrait basically in the book about the Irish Catholic community mm -hmm. in the west of Scotland. So it's, it's very much a Celtic book or a Celtic novel. And it's a very good read. Thanks, Billy, yeah. So your second song, what would that be and why did you pick it? Um, well, what I thought I'd do is I'd try and go through chronologically a list of songs and maybe you can see if my taste in music has developed over the years. So going back to Fort Augustus, I could have picked a number of songs because when you've moved around a lot, I think the songs that you hear always remind you of where you were and what you were doing at that particular time and place. So from Fort Augustus, I could have gone, it's the early 80s, so I could have gone for Ultravox, Vienna, Tainted Love, Soft Cell, Don't You Want Me Baby. I remember hearing all these songs up at the school. Uh, but the one that, that I've chosen is one that I liked at the time and I still like now. I mean, it's got gratuitous drugs references in it that completely went over my head at the time. Uh, but it's got a really haunting melody and I like it still to this day. And it's uh, 
The Stranglers and Golden Brown. Golden Brown by The Stranglers. Who are your influences and your heroes? Um, well, I think I'm more attracted to... I mentioned Jim Morrison already, but I think I'm attracted to characters that challenge conventions and don't accept preconceived ideas and ask questions of what's going on in the world. I think from a, from a sporting context, my personal hero was Paul McStay uh, from the 90s and probably Henrik Larsson as well. Paul McStay seemed to epitomise for me everything that's good about a Celtic man, just the way about he went about his business. For, certainly for my generation, you know, he's a wee bit older than me, but you know, for older generations there might be someone like Jimmy Johnston. But nowadays I'm kind of a bit cynical about... I, I don't do hero worship, really, the way certainly the way that I used to. If someone is portrayed as being a sporting hero, then I, I instinctively ask... You know why? I, I, my instincts are not to believe the hype, but I, I, I like characters and sportsmen in all sports that have reached the top. But I mean, sometimes you hear people say, "Oh, he's got that nastiness that you need to reach mm-hmm. the top." That's just for me. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look at the people that have really reached the top of their sport, uh, someone like Roger Federer or Sachin Tendulkar or even Leo Messi, you know, they they don't have that nastiness. They're just dedicated to their sport and the. You know they excel at it. So these are the guys that I would say I look up to and admire the most in sport now. Right, Stephen, your third song. Yeah, well, my third song is from the New Romantic movement. There was a band called Heaven Seventeen. Uh, they were from Sheffield. They had pretty impeccable socialist credentials, and that's not something you necessarily associate with the New Romantic movement. Punk rockers from you know, a few years earlier, and a lot of the modern songs are quite political as well but in a different way if you think of all the honeys making money and all that kind of stuff that is quite a political song it's just record company politics but back in the day Heaven 17 they had a number two I think they never had quite had a number one with a song called Temptation but this is one of the more political songs that I remember liking at the time uh, and it's called Trust by the Wheels of Industry So what are your earliest memories of going to Celtic Park? Uh, Juventus, 1981, you know, mm. straight in there. None of this, well, let's take him off to a, you know, a Wraith Rovers game or a League Cup <laughs> sectional <laughs> game, just the European Cup. I'd, I'd been to football games before because we'd moved down to... My mum and dad are both teachers by profession, so... And we moved down to Kilmarnock when I was very young indeed, and they'd take me to Rugby Park a few times. I'm assured that I'd been to see Celtic as well at Rugby Park, but I don't really remember it. But uh, Juventus was the first game that I, I was ever at Celtic Park, and it was amazing. I remember walking into the jungle, and you know what Celtic Park's like in European nights, you know. pitch was amazing, looked amazing. The, it was bathed in floodlights, and the atmosphere was unbelievable. I remember all the Celtic fans were cheering Liam Brady, and not being, like, indoctrinated that from a young age, I didn't know why they were cheering him. You know, he was on the other team. It was only later that I realised it was because he was Irish. During the 80s, I would because we were living down south or elsewhere, whenever we used to come back up for family holidays or to visit relatives, that's the first thing we'd usually do. We'd usually go to a game. So I remember Werder Bremen in the 80s, Mick McCarthy, no pace whatsoever. He was like on a, a conveyor belt going backwards, you know. Yeah. We lost that game. The Germans basically just hit it over the top and scored, knocked out the European Cup in that game. And then I went to university down in Exeter. And at the time... National Express were doing this deal for students where you could go anywhere in the country I think it was for £9 return Mm -hmm. that's what I did basically, I took them up on that and got an overnight 12 hour bus journey up from Exeter to Glasgow, met my cousin went to the game, headed back to Hesbeck get changed, headed for a night out in the town, lay about all day Sunday recovering (laughs) and then get a 12 hour bus journey back down the road in time for lectures and that was my weekends a couple of times that kind of coincided with Rangers winning nine in a row so it was bad timing from my point of view uh, because during most of the 80s although I went to a few games I wasn't really following the club on a week to week basis you know because I was, I was away from the scene really so I have no memory of for example winning the league in 86 on the last day of the season uh, that's all just I've all just discovered that you know it's history really Similarly with uh, centenary double winning season, the day that Celtic won the double, I, w- I was playing cricket at school, <laughs> you know, and I came off the pitch and somebody said to me, oh, Wimbledon have just beaten Liverpool in the FA Cup, so I was pretty detached from it all at that point, right. but around about the age of 17, 18, I thought, right, I don't just want to be a notional Celtic supporter, I want to be a proper Celtic supporter, I was really attracted to that idea, mm-hmm. and that obviously in- involved going to games, so I got myself up the road that summer, I uh, went to a couple of games with my cousin, as I say, it was right at the start of the nine in a row years, 
and Celtic were dreadful at the time. I think I went to two or three games. I think by the time I left, we were bottom of the league mm-hmm. after two or three games at the start of one season. But it didn't deter me at all. I've followed the club on a weekly basis now, uh, ever since then, really. And these days, these days, I'm a season ticket holder. Excellent. So, your fourth song? During my teenage years, um, I went through a bit of a mellow phase, as you do. I became a bit obsessed with Mike Oldfield. Uh, I thought he was a terrific musician. Obviously, he did, he did these uh, album-length compositions, so I'm not sure we've got half an hour to play. Side one of Tubular Bells. Uh, so I've just gone for a short piece by Mike Oldfield called Mount Terry. Right, Stephen. What irritates you? Not too much, really. Certainly in terms of stuff that's not important uh, and trivial, I, I tend to be quite good at, you know, I can sit, sweat the small stuff. But one of the things that I do think is important is Scottish football. Yeah, it irritates me a bit that to see the decline in Scottish football in recent years, in particular the role that kind of sections of the mainstream media seem to have played in that and the way they've kind of danced around it. A lot of them seem to indulge in what I sometimes refer to as aggravated stupidity. In other words, they're not stupid, they know what they're doing but they assume a kind of level of stupidity and ignorance in their audience, which I don't believe exists. I think we're onto them, really. I think we're quite sophisticated Scottish football supporters, and we know what they're doing, but they assume that you can't see what they're doing, and they try and foist their narratives and their agendas on you in this way. Um, so I find that irritating. New Cole Rangers irritate me a wee bit, I must admit. They, they, they probably shouldn't admit that to you, Billy, because you know, that's probably their intention, so... But yeah, and particularly this kind of blatant falsehood as far as I can tell that they're the same club. I mean, I don't know how many blogs I must have read going into detail arguing why they're not the same club and one or two that argue why they are the same club. But for me, it's blatantly obvious they were liquidated Mm -hmm. and there is no precedent for a, a football club that can't die. How they can get away with it, I mean, the fact that they came out with it to start with, then the fact that it's kind of gains kind of widespread acceptance... And then when people say, oh, no, hang on a minute here, this is just wrong, uh, they've got a whole army at their behest that is going to you know, rise up and intimidate people in ways that we've seen. So, yeah, that irritates me a, a wee bit, and I, I, I don't think we should stand for it, basically. Mm-hmm. Right, we're now at your fifth song. My fifth song, for some reason, in my late teens, I got this impression that Simon and Garfunkel were really cool. I don't know where that came from. I remain a kind of Paul Simon fan to this day. I think he's I think he's excellent. You know, really witty guy, really emotional, intelligent songwriter. Where I got the idea he was cool for him, I'm not <laughs> sure. Especially with that big galoot standing beside him. <laughs> when I was kind of 16, I'd never had a lover, so uh, the idea of having 50 ways to leave one actually quite <laughs> quite appealed to me. So uh, I've chosen that song, "50 Ways to Leave Your Lover" by Paul Simon. That was 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover by Paul Simon. Right, how do you relax? Uh, relaxing is not really a problem for me, Billy. Um, it's the opposite that's, that's the, the problem for me. Um, because when when you're a writer, you know, and you're trying to produce a book, it's not like another job, you know, no one comes up and pats you on the back and says, that's two hours work you've done there, well done. Uh, no one says to you, right, I really like that bit that you've written there the day. You don't get paid for it. And if you're trying to produce your first book, uh, you know, the rejection letters are coming in as fast as you're sending submissions out most of the time. So it can be quite hard to be motivated uh, and to have determination and focus and willpower. And these are, that's been my problem more than relaxing anyway Mm. but I think what I like to do is go for a a drive occasionally because I moved away quite a young age all these places that I used to come back to to visit relatives places like Kitten Tower, Torrance and Lennox Town, Campsie Hills they're all there as part of my childhood Mm. I mean I've lived in Glasgow now for years and years Uh, it's still strange that they're they're just there you know, half an hour's drive away, so I like to go out for a drive to see these places, up the campuses, out to Celtic's training ground, maybe have a, have a wee look down from up there, and I quite enjoy doing that. Your sixth song, what will that be? My sixth song is uh, a bit of classic rock. When I was at uni, somebody gave me a, a recording of this Led Zeppelin album, Led Zeppelin album remasters, and I liked virtually every track off it, but the classic one, of course, is Stairway to Heaven. Right, Stephen. So what does the future hold for you? Well, I'd like to keep writing, Billy. 
I'm not too sure what the future is going to hold. I'm a bit like Gordon Strachan, really. I'll know what, what the future holds when I get there, you know. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to keep writing. Uh, I've got a second book that's almost done now, and that's provisionally entitled The Scottish Football Debate. But I've, I'm having a bit of an argument with a publisher over that title, but it's the title that I'd like to call it. And it's one of the minor characters in the first book, Paradise Road, becomes the narrator of the second book. Mm-hmm. He, he, Peter Fitzpatrick, he comes back to Glasgow after a spell abroad. He's looking around for something to do, and he manages to persuade the national broadcaster to allow him to present this show, talking about everything to do with a beautiful game, mm-hmm. football, a national game in Scotland. And it all goes very well. The show's a big success until the biggest story in the history of Scottish football lands on him. I'm sure you can guess what that is and that's when the editorial independence that the show's always enjoyed becomes compromised and I won't spoil what happens in the book but uh, that's where the trouble starts basically once uh, liquidation they have to uh, discuss liquidation of Rangers in the same kind of open and honest way that they've always enjoyed in the show Mm -hmm. because that's his pitch when he comes back from abroad he's seen these shows done uh, more professionally more intelligently more seriously than usually get in the kind of genre in Scotland yeah. so that's his pitch to the, to the national broadcast and that's the reason he gets the show in the first place it's quite different from the first book because uh, it's not about a joiner who's a rejected ex-footballer It's he, he's a pal mm. of Kevin from the first book uh, but he's a guy who's been at university so that gives me a kind of different voice to explore some of the similar issues in a totally new context and a new story of course apart from that um, I have tentative plans for other books. I'd like to write a great European novel about a, a professional footballer who gets transferred around Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we see the mentality and the culture of football in different countries through this character as he kind of moves around Europe. Uh, he starts off at Celtic. I think I might have him go out on loan to the Czech Republic and then get transferred to Germany, Spain, Italy, just so we can see the different mentalities. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, it's about European people. And I'd also like to maybe do a non-fiction book about the history of Scottish football incorporating the whole Rangers story and I've had uh, a couple of meetings with Patrick Riley who people might know from his contribution to the Celtic Minded mm. anthologies uh, I think he did a piece in 10 Days at Shook Celtic as well and he, he he's actually better known as the first Catholic who was made Professor of English Literature at Glasgow University since the Reformation. Mm. So he's, he's very well respected and I've had a couple of meetings with him about doing a, a history of Scottish football book and it turns out he's actually related to me through marriage. His niece is my auntie, so we're related not by blood but by marriage. Oh. So I've had a couple of meetings with him uh, and that's something I might like to do as well. Right, I have a couple of wee extra questions for you. Sure. What would you like to see changed in Scotland? Well, I would like to see Scotland changed into a kind of socialist utopia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that aside, you know, eliminating poverty and inequality and all these things. Um, but aside from that, you know, fairy tales like that, I think I'd like to see Sc- Scottish football restored to its former glories. Because I think in recent years, the ownership of the game has been taken away from fans. You know, fans instinctively kind of owned the game in the past. It was their game. Whereas now it's owned by uh, the money men and the media and they've taken away the ownership of the game from ordinary supporters and then they sell it back to them at these vastly inflated prices. Mm. Uh, so I'd like to see that restored and I think if it was, then Scottish football would be on the up and up again sooner rather than later. Who in history would you like to meet and why? I think I'd like to meet Brother Walfred. Mm-hmm. I think I'd like to go back there just to those early meetings and just ask them do you, do you know what you're doing here you know do you know the implication do you know the legacy that you're going to leave yeah. do you know what's going to happen here is this just uh, you know an idea to raise money for you know a few poor people and you know you know maybe carry it on next year as well if it goes well mm. or do you, you know do you know what's going <laughs> exactly how this is going to turn out I'd like to yeah be a fly on the wall in those early meetings uh, at the foundation of Celtic who's your favourite Cartoon character. Uh, who's my favourite cartoon character? And, uh, am I allowed any cartoon character? Am I allowed? Is Captain Pugwash allowed? Anything <laughs> <laughs> you want. All right. Well, never mind. Uh, Seaman Stains. I've, I've I've met a few Elmore Fuds in my time. Popeye. I think uh, Bluto. He he looks a bit like a Ranger supporter, doesn't he? And Popeye's always getting the better of him. Maybe Popeye. Maybe Bugs Bunny. Just because he's always outsmarting that Elmore Fudd. 
But the one I think I'm going to have to go for is Bod, because my girlfriend would never forgive me if I didn't. Uh, she's actually pregnant at the moment, and we don't have a name for the baby other than Baby O'Donnell or Bod, so <laughs> I'm going to go for Bod. Fantastic. Right, your penultimate song. My penultimate song is Cigarettes and Alcohol by Oasis. I think, um, you know, you love them or loathe them, I think they were really carrying the flag for, you know, proper music into the 90s. I think after, you know, whatever it was, four or five decades of, of popular music, I think the record companies eventually figured out how to do away with these creative and artistic people that they used to rely on to make their money yeah. and they came out with all these kind of manufactured bands and pop princesses and all the rest of it mm. uh, but Oasis kept it going um, and this is a great youth anthem cigarettes and alcohol right we've come to the part of the program where I give you the complete works of the dandy and a copy of the bible to take with you to your island would you like a copy of the bible I'll certainly take a copy of the bible Billy yeah I remember when I was at school, I was surrounded by, you know, this is, I'd moved to school in England by this stage. For some reason, I was in the top set, and I was surrounded by these 15-year-old pseudo-intellectuals who took great pleasure in telling me why they were atheists. Mm -hmm. And I was always like, no, 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 uh, how can you say that? You know, I believe in God, or uh, uh, the worst I could say was that I was an agnostic, you know, because you can't say these things for sure. Certainly not when you're 15, I thought. But it turns out they were right. I've kind of, my faith has lapsed. But certainly it's an interesting book, the Bible, and it's where all our moral kind of teaching comes from. And that's a cornerstone of Western civilization, I suppose. And that's where we get our, our moral code from, is from the Hebrews. So, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I wouldn't take it all as literally, certainly, but uh, interesting read. Right, you're allowed another book. What would it be, and why? I'd have to take Train Spotting by Irvin Welsh. I remember when it came out. I mean, there was some sort of literary scene in Edinburgh in the early nineties. Uh, there was guys producing pamphlets and guys writing short stories, and one or two people had novels published. But still, Train Spotting did kind of just seemed to come out of nowhere you know it would just sort of blazed out of nowhere and I remember in the 90s late 90s I used to carry my copy ar around everywhere I went and I think when I started writing to an extent I was copying his style because that's that's what you're told to do you know just copy the style of someone you like and then develop your own and that's, uh, that's kind of how it worked out so it was a key text for me and it kind of gave the lie to any kind of cosy notions of a classless society particularly in Edinburgh which was seen as quite a kind of well-off, middle-class, morning side doctors and accountants and lawyers kind of city. Uh, so he inverted that stereotype, and in Paradise Road, I try to do something similar in my own way and invert the stereotype of Glasgow, you know, so we see, while the characters couldn't be described as anything other than working class, they're not people whose lives are blighted by poverty and destitution and criminality. They have issues and problems and they don't always react well to them, but basically they're trying to be good people. Uh, they come from good families and good communities. So I've inverted, tried to invert that stereotype as well. Yeah. Right, you're allowed the luxury in Ireland. Something to make your life a bit more bearable. But remember, it can't be a human being and it can't be a mobile phone. I think it would have to be uh, a pair of binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if yeah, if I was going to be on my own in a desert island, I think I'd want to bring my world closer together, uh. and maybe keep up a bit of the old astronomy as well. <laughs> See what's going on out there. Right, your final song. My final song is um, well. During the course of researching Paradise Road, um, I went back to all the all the Celtic songs, all the uh, the rebel songs, so-called rebel songs, all the Irish songs. I mean, I'd heard most of them uh, from travelling on buses and from making cassettes with your friends and things like that I mean I really discovered or rediscovered a great canon of Celtic songs mm -hmm. uh, and there's this one wee song that I like because it talks about the greatest day in Celtic's history and it's by a band called Charlie and the Boys it's called Inter Milan Stephen O'Donnell thank you very much for being a Desert Island Tim Brilliant Billy thanks